I have a, a, a little handout here. You can take a look at it if you want it. You can email me. Um, and this is how to build a, a, a disc hanger for your lathe. And by the way, if you haven't discovered the benefits of uh, kitchen sink cut-up material from cabinet, from a kitchen countertop manufacturers, that's discards for them. They have to cut it out, and they, they don't they don't have anything they can do with it. And you, if you if you're nice to them, you can get them for free. If not, it costs you three bucks. And I make tools and all kinds of stuff out of this kitchen sink cutout material. And this this standard was made from that. Uh, I also had an article published in uh, Wood Turning Design on how to make an index wheel for your lathe. Uh, I've got a little article here about how to create a uh, a clamp for segmented bowls. I also, uh, have any of you uh, seen a robust lathe uh, tool rest? It has a hardened steel rod on the top. And it, the tool slides so nice. And you can make your own with some steel angle and buy hardened uh, drill rod and epoxy the rod to the top of the steel angle. Works perfectly. I got a, a handout for doing that sort of thing. I turned my first bowl, I know it's hard to believe as young as I look, but I turned my first bowl 59 years ago when I was 14. That tells you how old I am. And I fell in love with woodworking. I couldn't believe how wonderful woodworking. You just have to hold the tool and do this and you get something pretty. And so I became a woodworking teacher and uh, in my first year of teaching woodworking, I was there weren't books, this is back in the 60s, and there weren't books on segmented turning and turning green wood and everything that there is now. In fact, I saw Richard Raffin on a book, on the cover of a book. He was in a pair of shorts, they call them stubbies in Australia, they're really short shorts, thongs and a singlet, and that's what he was turning in. And I didn't know who it was, but I thought that guy has to be an Aussie because that's the, that's the Aussie uniform. It's a single <laughs> pair of stubbies and thongs. And uh, so anyway, I, there, weren't, there wasn't anything to teach you how to do stuff, so I was trying to figure out a way to make segmented bowls, although I didn't even know the term segmented bowls. I just wanted to glue some wedges together, teach my boys how to turn a bowl, and I thought it would look pretty. And uh, I, was, I was not being careful and running a piece of wood on the joiner and it hit or not and flipped, and I ended up nine and a half fingers. <laughs> and, uh, and so I didn't do any more turning for a while. And then I ended up in Australia for four years where I taught. And I did a little turning there, but not much. And I came back to the States in 84, sold all of my tools. Wasn't, and I just didn't want to do anything. And uh, when I turned 60, I decided to go back to Australia. And a picture on my website. By the way, if you've got a pen and you want to know my website, it's www. C O E U R dash D E dash L A R B R E dot com. If you're French, that's Cour de Labre. Anybody know what Cour de Labre means? Come on. You can, what? Heart of the wood. Almost heart of the tree. Labre is remember Arbor Day? We plant trees on Arbor Day. So heart of the tree. And uh, you can email me from my website, I'll answer any questions, and there's all kinds of things that you can uh, download from the website, I'll maybe have a chance to show you some of those if we have enough time. But I, I uh, when I was 60, I went back to Australia to visit my friends, and I had two friends that, one was an auto mechanic and one was a cement uh, finisher. Neither of them craftsmen. And I'm having dinner, lunch with one guy, and we're, we're walking away from each other in the parking lot. And just as he gets to his car, he hollers, and he knows I'm a woodworker, okay? He hollers, oh, I forgot to tell you, I bought a lathe and I'm turning wood. And I, oh, oh I was so jealous. I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm a woodworker, and he doesn't know anything about, and he's doing it, and I'm not. So, I, and I wasn't angry, but I was just, you know, you know. So I go to visit my other friend the cement worker, and we're sitting in his living room, and he says, let me show you what I'm doing now. So I go out to his, uh, his shed, every Australian shop is called a shed, and he's got an eight foot tall man saw that was built in the 1890s, sitting in uh, his shed, and he has a home-built lathe made out of uh, 
train rail and angle iron just cobbled together with terrible welds and his tool is a piece of galvanized pipe about five feet long with another piece sticking out and a piece of tool steel welded onto the end. And <clears throat> this guy never does anything fine. He doesn't understand fine work. But he was go he'd go to the dump and he'd get telephone poles, uh, hardwood, gumwood. He'd, he'd cut them up about that long, take them on, put them on his lathe, and he'd take a, about a half an inch off of the surface and he's down to really beautiful Australian gumwood, really hard. And he was making the shape like this, the old milk jug, you know, he'd come up, in, up, out, flat top and handles on the, he would put a drill rod, he'd drill it and put a lamp rod in it and wire it and was selling them as fast as he could make them to shops in Sydney. And that, that sucker was really heavy. You could never knock that lamp over. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm thinking, this isn't fair. I, I know about wood turning. I've made some beautiful stuff. And here these guys are doing what I want to do. So I come home and I thought, I'm not going to buy a lathe until I figure out exactly what I want to do. So I looked and I spent a year. I bought wood, I bought tools, I bought a wood turning smock, I bought it all and uh, finally figured out what I wanted to do and it was segmented turning. I found a website, can't tell you the name of it now because of the, the gentleman is dead, but he was an Englishman and his bowls were unbelievably beautiful and I've got some on my website, I'll, I'll show you maybe tonight if I have a chance. And uh, they were compound stave segmented bowls. Anybody here make a compound stave bowl? It's hard. You got to really, and it, you have to really be accurate with compound staves because they're all wedges, and then the edges are angled, and you, you, it's got to be right. If it's not right, it did not work. So he was selling some tapes, VCR tapes, and so I ordered three of them, sixty bucks. I got them, and they were uh, they were so badly produced that I had to turn the volume all the way up and, and the static of my TV and I could still barely hear him. And then uh, he was an English engineer and so he was using English idiom and slang. If I had lived in Australia, I would have never understood half the things he was saying. And yet, the, the bowls are so beautiful. So I called him up and I, and I said, look, I, your bowls are beautiful, but these tapes stink. I want my money back. And he went, <laughs> I'm at 60 bucks. I know these bowls are beautiful. So I decided I'm going to watch those tapes until it, it, I either go crazy or I figure out how to do it. And finally I did and I made a bowl, compound stave, turned out pretty nice. It's the last bowl on my website. And uh, I sent a picture of it to him and an apology. And his widow emailed me back. And she said, uh, my husband died last January. He was 93 when he passed. He made the videos when he was 87. And his wife was the cameraman. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, but he would be really pleased to know that, that you've been successful. And by the way, he was riding his motorcycle uh, uh, until a month before he died. <laughs> 93. Wow. So anyway, that's how I got started doing segmented bowls. But I, I started with the hardest thing first, compound state. And then I discovered other kinds of segmenting, and then I discovered uh, Malcolm Tibbetts and, and several other well-known segmenters, and they discovered the concept of a bowl from a board. I am lazy. I am the laziest wood turner you've ever seen. And some of you probably are in that club with me. I don't want to do anything harder than it actually has to be, and I wanted to end up with the most beautiful piece of work. And I discovered some things I'm going to share with you tonight that can transform your ordinary segmented bowls into extraordinary segmented bowls. And uh, several of these things I learned on that World of Woodturners website. But uh, the way that, uh, and I, I've got some things that I'll send around. This is, this is a, uh, a bowl, mesquite and bloodwood. And I won first prize in the Texas State Fair with this. This was made from the bowl of the board concept. And uh, it's as simple as it can be. You just have to know how to put the pieces together. And that star on the back goes all the way through the bowl. And I've got uh, some samples up here. And I'll show you how to do that if we have time. 
This is, uh, this is <clears throat> I call this Starburst. This is Fiddleback Maple, uh, Purple Heart, Texas Ebony, which is persimmon that's grown in soil that has a high iron content, so it turns the persimmon black, and white and black veneer. This bowl right here I call Midnight at the Oasis, and uh, it's uh, quilted maple and walnut and walnut veneer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a bowl I call, uh, I can't remember what I call this, but this is cherry, yellow heart, and zebra wood. And on the back is uh, how I made, now I'll pass this out, because these are the, the, the photos that show how I made that, this bowl. And these photos show how I made this bowl. And uh, you can take a look at those. And basically, they're all made with the same method, with just a few tweaks. And, and so what I've done is I've done I've, I've, uh, if you come on Saturday, you need to bring two boards with you. About, depending on the size of your lathe, if you can turn a 12 inch bowl, then two 6 inch boards, 12 inches long. Uh, if you've got a 10 inch lathe, then two 5 inch boards, 10 inches long. And uh, what we're going to do is show you how to cut them out on a bandsaw. And even if you don't have a bandsaw, you need to learn how to do this because you're going to want to get a bandsaw because this makes it so easy. <laughs> uh, and I did this just out of MDF to, to show you how, how easy it is. <clears throat> you, you, and I'll show you in the demonstration, but uh, you draw, you put the two boards together, you take a compass and you draw concentric circles. And how, you make the circles as wide as the board is thick. And then when they're all circles are drawn, you take the two boards apart, you take one board on your bandsaw, you tilt the bandsaw 45 degrees, and you start cutting that first circle out. And then you cut the second one, and you cut the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and then you stack them, and glue them together, And the thing I love about this is you, you waste almost no wood in making that bowl. And so one of the things I learned from World of Wood Turners is if you want to make a beautiful bowl, buy beautiful wood. Buy highly figured wood. Because if you're going to do it like this, you're not going to waste anything. And so it's not going to really cost you that much and your project will be that much more beautiful because the wood is showing itself. Uh, the other thing I like about this is there's, because there's no waste, all you're, all you're really doing once you've gotten the thing glued together is you're smoothing it with your lathe tools and then sanding it. And um, I, I use a right angle die grinder. You can buy a Harbor Freight for nine bucks, air power, but I never hook it up to my air compressor. I just use it to hold my sanding pad, which has a quarter inch shaft on it and Velcro on the end of the sanding pad. And I use uh, Velcro, I'm King's Floor uh, sandpaper. It's cheap and it's really good. I buy uh, five inch discs and I take a galvanized uh, pipe nipple and sharpen the end. If, uh, if you buy this size disc from King's Floor, it costs 30 cents a piece. If you buy this size disc and punch out three, it costs you 15 cents a piece. So, Huge savings. I'm now down to using one inch discs on my sander because if you use those kind of uh, pads for sanding, you realize you're only using a half inch outside edge of that sandpaper. So uh, that's another thing that I really uh, makes my uh, sanding go well. So let me go ahead and get started. Gene, would you uh, click it? Okay, now this is a demonstration I gave in Australia. Forgive me, they're metric and, and 
you guys will just have to convert on the fly. Uh, go ahead, next one. Gene, uh, Gene Smith says, over 80, he's a little slow. Come on, Jim. What do you mean a little slow? <laughs> Oops, we just lost the presentation. <laughs> Who else wants to help? Stamp them together and uh, find the center. Next. And uh, in this particular case, 18 millimeters was the thickness of the board. So that's how, that's why I made uh, the circle sticker. Go ahead. And when you do that, if it's square, then it's 45 degrees. Now, you can make any angle you want, but it's easier when you're starting out just to do it at 45. Next. And then you just start cutting out. Next. So I'm cutting out the inside. Keep going. Next. Next. You can tell it's me. You see the stub. Next. <laughs> Next. And then you, that's what you're left with. And, uh, and one of the things that the guy, this Englishman, taught me is the power of hot melt glue. I, I, I put a faceplate onto a piece of MDF, turned it around, and, and, and marked with a pencil some concentric circles on it. So I take that, once I've got it glued together, and I center it on that faceplate, and I put hot melt glue, not all, not all the way around, but just on spots, and that really holds it on the faceplate. So then, I've turned that bottom recess, and once I've turned that bottom recess, if I want to, and I'm fearful that it might come off, I can put my tail stock up to the end and turn the outside and get it all done, or, or I could just take it off and put it on my scroll check and turn the inside and the outside, and you never have to touch that foot again, and it's finished, except for putting a seal in it. So that's what that bowl looks like, okay, when it's, go ahead, next. When it's stacked up, and I put that one together because I was rushing to get it. Yes. Wait, did you just put those pieces together so you have one seam, or did you stagger them? I staggered them. You'll see it in just a second. Right. But I used epoxy on this to put it together quickly. Go ahead, next. And I used the, the, the best clamping device in the world. Next, rubber bands. Okay, I use rubber bands almost exclusively if I can. Next. <laughs> Two rubber bands on there. And then when the glue is dry, all I got to do is sand it flat, top and bottom. Next. And then, in order to, uh, I have a drum sander. Many of you might not have one, but if you have a disc sander, you can still flatten them on your disc sander. So I put a couple of tacks of glue on the inside of that disc. Next. And I mark the surface with a piece of chalk. If you don't have chalk in your shop, you're missing out on one of the best tools. I use it for everything. And then next. I hold it up to the, I have a 20 inch bed, lathe, so I have a 20 inch disc sander. That thing is beautiful. It's amazing. And uh, next, and I just, my fingers aren't anywhere near, you know, I can't afford to lose any more. So my fingers are not close to that sander, but I'm able to flatten that surface. And I do that with each of them. Next. And, uh, and then I stagger the joints. And this one, I just staggered them, you know, 180 degrees. Next. And then that's one clamping fixture that you can use before you put the bottom on. It's real cheap if you, you know, don't have a big thing with a wind down clamp. You can do that to glue them together next. Or that's a clamping fixture that I made and I have a handout to show you how to do it. And I have a friend on a website that you can print it out if you want it. Next. And then I turn that little recess, put my chuck in there, but I've already turned the outside. And of course I use bird's eye maple for that. So it's, it's already going to come out looking great. Next. So that's the finished bowl. I don't like the fact that I can see the seams, but it was a really quick, easy way to get a pretty nice bowl made. Next. Next. Okay, now I made one. This is Australian lace wood. It's really hard. Anybody use Australian lace wood? It's beautiful wood, but it's hard. I did the same thing. Next. Same concept. Now I got a little bit of a rim working on this one. Next. By the way, that's a kitchen sink cutout turned upside down. <laughs> I use those things all the time. Rubber bands holding it together. Next. And that's the bowl that, that it turned out to be. Uh, and you can end up with a beautiful looking bowl 
with a very simple method. Next. Okay. And, and the thing I love about it is that you don't have all those wedges, okay, on each uh, ring. Next. That's uh, uh, the ring press. You can build one of those things. Really simple. The, the, uh, it's a book binder's clamp that you buy from Woodcraft or uh, Rockley or any of those places. It costs about 15 bucks. Everything else you can buy at, in the hardware store or have in your shop. Next. Okay, <clears throat> this one is uh, was a commission. I call it Anniversary Vink, the 20th anniversary. This guy said to me, I want to give my wife something every year on our anniversary. I have a craftsman make her something out of the same number of pieces that we have celebrating years. So 13th anniversary, I had her something made that had 13 pieces in it. So he said, this is our 20th. You think you can make a bowl out of 20 pieces? Well, I said, sure. And I actually photographed the whole process so that she could count each. Go ahead, next. And cherry and ebony. And that's the bowl that I ended up with. But there's a little subterfuge going on here. But I'll tell you what it is, but you couldn't tell it by looking at the bowl. Next. So this is how I started out. Uh, uh, this, is, this is one half of the bowl. That's the other half of the bowl. And if you'll count, there's one, two, three, four, five, ten pieces of cherry, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen pieces of ebony. Good for typical to see, but it's between, the ebony is between the yeah, The ebony is actually standing up. It's an eighth of an inch stick, standing up in between the pieces of cherry. Next. So I'm getting ready to glue it all together using... Uh, uh, can you say cut out the material because glue doesn't stick to that stuff? And wax paper. Go ahead, next. And I, I glue the, these pieces together, but I don't glue the two halves together. Uh, the two, each of the pieces in each half are glued, but not the middle joint. Next. So there they are, all glued up. Next. And now I've got these two clamps in there, holding them so I can draw the concentric circles. So I marked the circles out, and this was pretty thick wood that I was using. Next. And now I'm cutting it out of my bandsaw. Next. Actually, I think that wood was like an inch and an eighth. It was really beautiful stuff. Next. So there it is. And just because of the way I glued it up, you can see the, the design starting to take shape. Next. Next. Now I've got to, got to glue those rings together, and these are the really big rubber bands you can buy from Rocklear. Okay? They're a little difficult to work with, but they will, they will work. Next. So I have a drum sander, and I didn't have to hold them up to my disc sander. I was able to run them through my drum sander and flatten them all. When I got them all flat, and you've got to be real careful not to take too much off, because these, the, all these lines have a tendency to start not lining up anymore. So. Because I was getting paid 600 bucks for this bowl, I decided I'd better make this as good as I could. Next. And there I am putting hot milk glue around the outside edge before I put it on my lathe. Next. That's all. You're just putting it around the outside edge. Yeah, that's it. And I don't put it continuously. I put it about maybe eight places. You got an MDF faceplate. Yeah. There's a real, there's a oh, steel faceplate on the back of the MDF. MDF. What? How much use do you get out of the MDF? Oh, I probably made oh half a dozen bowls out of each each MDF plate, maybe more. Uh, and I because I I just chiseled the, the the glue will hold, but it comes off when you want it to come off pretty easily. Why don't you make your face plates out of that coriander? Out of the uh, the kitchen sink cutout material? It's not flat. Okay, the kitchen sink cutout material all has a slight bow to it. And it's great for a whole bunch of things, but not for this. I needed this to be dead flat, and MDF is dead flat. Next. So there it is on my lathe, and I don't know if you recognize that lathe. That's a Harbor Freight $177 special, okay? And I, I didn't have a lot of money when I started, but I had a lot of desire. So one of the things that I did was uh, this, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Yes, I decided I wanted to have a bigger swing than 12 inches, and I wanted a bigger motor. So I, the motor on that comes out 
this way. And, uh, and so I bought a big motor and turned it around and made an adapter and uh, the motor cut sticks out that way. And then I raised the headstock up, took two pieces of kitchen sink cut up material, glued them together so they were for my cut top and bottom. <clears throat> That's a little over an inch and a half. And I made an uh, exact shape for the base of the headstock and bolted it back down and bolted the headstock on it. Then I made the same uh, platform, raised my tool rest up, and that's the, the, the raised up part. So now this is the 15 and a quarter inch lathe, what it used to be 12, and it had a, one and a, had a two horsepower mower on it where I had a three quarter before. And you see this box up here, it also has a variable speed on a remote switch. So I, I, you know, I always mess with things. So anyway, next. So there's the outside turn and my recess turn and it's sanded. Anybody got any idea why those grooves are in there? Hide the glue line. Hide the seams? Huh? I hide the glue line? No, not hide the glue line. To hide where they don't line up quite right? Exactly. My granddad was an old carpenter. He used to say to me, the best carpenters know how to hide their mistakes. <laughs> and so I realized that they weren't quite lining up, and I thought, wait a minute, if I put a groove in the right place, you couldn't see the mismatch. So I put those grooves in there. All right, next. And a little design element. You, you remember Bob Ross, uh, the painter on sure, TV yeah, with the yeah. afro hair? Yeah. What do you call them? Happy accidents? He used to talk about yeah. All right, so there's the inside, all done. And now I got some black circles. Where did they come from? Well, they didn't want to line up on the outside. They weren't lining up on the inside either. So I took a, a real small round nose tool, actually a parting tool, I think, and I carved uh, a recess, three recesses in there. And then I took uh, uh, masking tape and I created a dam right on the bottom edge of each of those recesses. And then I mixed up epoxy and black tempera paint to make the epoxy black and I poured epoxy in each one of those recesses and when they dried I pulled the tape off and then turned that down and the, and the epoxy turned and sanded looks exactly like the ebony it's amazing so next you don't have to be Handsome, you just have to be smart. <laughs> uh, so, so we got we got 18 pieces of wood in this bowl, and I said to him, I said, "All right, you got 18 pieces in the bowl. How many pieces of black ebony you see there?" He said, two. That's 20. That was the 20th anniversary. But I took those two pieces and I cut some more. So next, I use a software called Wood Turner Pro, and I would encourage each of you to go online and. Uh, download it. You can download it and use it free for a month. Uh, and I think it only costs 20 bucks if you want to buy it. And it's fabulous. Gene uses something else, but he's a northerner. <laughs> so, uh, southerners, no, I'm just teasing. But anyway, it's a fabulous program. It does all the calculations for you. If you're going to do a bowl that's 12 inches in diameter, you say how many segments you want, how thick the wood's going to be. It tells you the angles. Uh, the, the outside dimension, the inside dimension, uh, how long the piece of wood has to be to start with that you're going to cut the wedges out of. I mean, it's fabulous. So it's worth trying it out anyway for 30 days. So I use that to make a template for those pieces that I'm going to do the rim with. Next. And I cut the rim out on the, my bandsaw. I had to be, had to be real careful with this uh, because you got to ma match up those edges as it goes around. Okay, so I got it as close as I could to the template. That template was produced by the software. Next. And then individually, I epoxied those pieces on using masking tape to hold them in place. And so I would, you know, I would keep going and, and the ebony stuck out the inside. It was, it was wider than the bowl was thick. So I had some play there. And then each time I laid a piece down, I had to play with that joint so that it would be just right until I got to the end. And fortunately, I was careful enough that it all worked. Next. And uh, now I'm turning the rim. Next. And that's the bowl, and you see my seal. 
in the bottom of the bowl, epoxy in place. And, uh, and he loved it. The guy loved the bowl. I don't know about his wife, but he loved the bowl. And baby, which was satisfaction for me. Next. And that's what it looks like. Now, I use a homemade uh, finish. And I would encourage each of you to go to Wood Central. Russ Fairfield is the guy's name on Wood Central. And he, he is the master guy of finishes. And he has a homebrew uh, formula for, for finishes. And I use his formula. And it is one part tongue oil, one part spar varnish, one part naphtha. I use naphtha. You can use a, a number of different thinners, but I like naphtha because it evaporates quite quickly. And, uh, <clears throat> and you, I mix it up in a ketchup. You know those squeeze bottle ketchup bottles? And, <clears throat> and I wet sand. I sanded this, all my projects I sand to 150 with my right angle die grinder and those Velcro pads. And when I get to 150, then I coat the bowl in the finish with a paper towel. And I put some finish on the, disc, on the sanding disc and I start sanding it again. And it makes a slurry real quickly. So if you've got an open grain wood, it fills the, the grain. But then <clears throat> I just sand, and I'm, I'm, I'm simple minded, you know, I'm a simple man. So I just go one, two, with my sander, in, into the center, back out, ten times, stop, take some finish and use it to wipe off the slurry. I clean the surface of the bowl. I put a 180 grit on my sander, put a little finish on it, do it again. And I go 180, 220, 240, 320, 400. And by the time I get to 400, it is so smooth you can't believe it. And one of the things that I don't do is put a gloss finish on my bowls. You know why? Gloss finishes show the defects. That's why ladies put makeup on. <laughs> it's a, no, I'm serious. Am I, am I telling the truth? You, you, one of the things ladies try to do is get the gloss off. They, they don't want their nose shiny, you know? So, and, a, and a satin finish makes everything look good. And so, uh, by the time I've gotten to 400 and I've wet sanded all the way up there, then I just let it set on my lathe, come down the next day, the next night, with double, a trip four aught. You understand what I'm saying? Four aught steel wool? Okay. And I lightly steel wool it. It's uh, unbelievable. I mean, it is so smooth you can't. Now you can put some wax on it if you want to, but <clears throat> I, I never. It's just so nice. Next. Ray, what's the name, name of the gentleman at Wood Central on the floor? Russ Fairfield. Greg? Yes. You said your joints didn't line up properly on that when you put the grooves in. Why didn't they line up properly and where was the, where was it showing? Those, those, can you back up? Those vertical pieces uh, of these lines that go like this, yeah. okay, <clears throat> because I, I, after I cut them out, then I had to flatten the rings, and that flattening changed the position just enough. It was a tiny, you could just see, they didn't quite match. But doing this took, it made all of the imperfections disappear. And here's, the, here's uh, something else that I learned uh, when I started wood turning. If you want to make something disappear, you make it the focus. See, those rings, this way, you see those rings right away. What you don't see is why those <laughs> rings are there. So one of the things that I, you'll see in several of my bowls is I use 40,000 thick veneer, okay, in between each joint. Now, that accomplishes two things. When you look at one of these bowls over here, and I'm not making any criticism. Can I see that last bowl? I didn't critique this with Earl. So, uh, when you see that bowl, well, the first thing you see are all the joints, right? You can't help it. It's just, that's what the eye sees. But if Earl had put veneer in there, and this is what happened for me, people look at the bowl and they say, how did you get those dark lines in there? They don't see that it's a joint. They see a piece of veneer. And here's another benefit. The veneer is dead flat. My joints may not be totally perfectly flat. And when you put a piece of veneer in and glue on both sides, you have 
You cut in half the misalignment. You with me? You understand what I'm saying? You reduce by half the, the, the lack of... So, I, I started putting veneer everywhere, and you'll see it in, in a couple of these bowls. Next, any place that I can. Yeah, go ahead. Now this was made from fiddleback maple. Remember, highly figured wood makes beautiful bowls. And, uh, and so it's purple heart on the rim and the bottom. And then all those little colored pieces in there are either purple heart or this piece right here is Texas ebony, which is persimmon grown in a soil that's high in iron and it turns the wood black. Real hard, can't get a lot of it, but I got a few strips and I glued white veneer and black veneer on each side of those pieces of Texas ebony. So when you look at it, you see black, white, and then a real thin black on each side of that. Go ahead, next. Now if you want to cut a lot of thin pieces of wood, this is the best way to do it. You make a sacrificial board, you put a little notch in it, and you, you set it up so that it will cut however thick you want it to be, an eighth or a sixteenth or three sixteenths. And you, and you cut through the uh, masking tape. And, and then when you cut that strip, you take the masking tape off, you put the board back into the little sled, put more masking tape on, cut the next one. It's the safest, easiest way to cut uh, wood strips. Keep all your fingers and make them all fit mm -hmm. the next. So uh, I had to sand these flat because they were pretty rough coming off my bandsaw. I mean, my table saw. So I made this sled with carpet tape next, and I ran them underneath my drum sander. But this is how I clamped those four pieces of veneer to the middle, the middle piece of Texas ebony. Next. Oh, by the way, those calls. What are they made of? In case you're seeing cut up material. Yeah. Next. And so there are all my pieces. I'm getting ready to do this now. This is going to look different than some of these other bowls that I've done, but it's all the same method. It's just tweaking how you put the thing together. Next. So now I've got all these wedges, okay, with purple heart and then a piece of laminated persimmon and veneer, da 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 da. And I've got a radiator clamp uh, holding everything together. This is uh, God's gift to wood turners. How many of you use radiator clamps? Okay, good. Uh, now I won't bother opening it, you know what it is. But, um, so what I did was, I, I decided, see if they're all numbered, 1 through 24. So this right here is my half joint, okay? So I glued all of these pieces together, and then I glued all of these pieces together, but no glue in the middle between the two halves. And what I did was I took those two pieces of purple heart out, and I put two quarter inch dowels just standing up, inch tall, in that joint, and when you tighten up that band clamp, the dowel allows the pieces of wood to move to find the true CD. fitting. Okay, so once that's done, next. Once that, there's the two pieces of dowel. Okay, so you can see that the, the joint here is bigger in the middle than it is out on the end. So there's a, you know, all my wedges weren't perfect, but I'm getting ready to make them perfect. Next. So they're all glued up. And now I put the band clamp back on. I cut that little piece of MDF so I could get a center for my compass. And I drew all the lines that I needed to draw on it. Next. Take the band clamp off. Take those two pieces of purple heart out. And I start cutting it. Next. Next. Now the, the, the rubber band <laughs> action again. So I get them all glued together, but to glue the two halves together, remember I took out those no. two pieces of purple heart. So I had to cut them up into sections, and I had to had a little section of purple heart in each half, two of them. Next, and in order to then get rid of them, then I had to take the coping saw and cut the excess off after the glue dry. Next, there they are, all ready to be stacked. Next. They're stacked together now. Obviously, I didn't do a very good job laying this thing out because I shouldn't have those steps. All right, but it didn't really matter. I had plenty to work with. Next. So I clamped them all together and I offset the joints. Okay? Do that for a couple of reasons. One, it makes it much stronger. 
and it keeps people from seeing any misalignment. Okay? You tried to line everything up, you couldn't do it. Next. So I put Purple Heart on the bottom, I put it on my uh, MDS ace plate, just barely fit. And uh, that was before I did the modifications to my lathe, because there's that old motor sticking out there. Uh, but I had that reset, so I turned it around. Next. And I, I finished it on the inside. I actually put a, a Purple Heart uh, rim on it, and, uh, and that was that bowl. Next. I think it's a finished picture. Next. Yeah, so that's the, that's that bowl. Fiddle bag made with purple heart. Next. I call that one Starburst. Next. Okay. Now this is uh, bamboo and purple heart. I have two uh, bamboo and purple heart bowls. Next. This one, that bamboo was a bamboo board. Any of you have seen any of those bamboo boards? You can buy, but they're n not cheap. But they had a piece that... Uh, Rock there one day, it was like two feet long and 12 inches wide, dead flat, and all laminated bamboo. I said, I'll take that. So I brought it home and I cut it up. So I've got two, I've got four three inch pieces of bamboo. And I cut a piece of the purple heart and a piece on the left and a piece in the middle of the same thickness. A piece on the, on the right is half the thickness of the other two pieces. Next. Because I'm going to glue them all together to do the bowl from a board. So, but I want the, the middle to be the same width as the others. Next. So, there they are. I've already cut them out. Next. And there they are. I did a better job lining that one up and, and setting my band saw. Next. So, uh, that's getting ready to be turned. Next. Oh, I got a flat. So, I put. Uh, carpet tape on this piece of, uh, actually that's a piece of material that's got plastic on it from uh, Home Depot, because I knew it was flat. Put carpet, uh, double-sided carpet tape on it, stuck all the pieces down and ran them through my drum sand. There's a lot of ways to say it, I just did it that way. Next. And then there's the bowl, I've turned the outside, I put my chuck in the uh, recess in the foot. Next. Turn it around, now it's getting ready to be turned and a rim put on, next. Next. And that's the inside turned and uh, the rim is flattened in preparation for a, a rim, next. Now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, cutting that, and I was talking to Earl, I think, uh, about when I'm doing anything to keep the wood from chipping, I typically use a parting tool on when I'm uh, Facing off the edge of that rim, I come at it from this direction, not from this direction. It, it, it's much easier to turn. So I'm doing the same thing there, except I'm just on an angle, turning that down to the shape of the bowl. Next. And next. Now I'm shaping the rim. Next. Right. Yes. It seems like using the expansion joint on, on the scroll shop to get the back of that, you get a very small area of pressure gripping on a, a, a wide hole. Yeah. It's kind of counter to everything. Well, know? first of all, if you're using really hard wood, and Purple Heart is really hard wood. I don't know if you use Purple Heart much. It's really hard. And, you, and those scroll chucks... And it also depends on the quality of the scroll chuck. Some scroll chucks aren't as good as others. <clears throat> you want a really good scroll chuck, buy a one-way. And both of my scroll chucks are one-way chucks, okay? That's the top of the line. They just work. They fit everything. I've only had, ever had one bowl come off a lathe, and it was because the foot was like that big around. It was the first bo second bowl I ever made. The foot was too small, and, and it was poplar. Not hard. Okay. Next. And then that's the finished uh, bowl. And I did a pretty good job of getting everything lined up so I didn't have to make any subterfuge there to hide the joints. Next. <clears throat> Next. Okay, now this is another bamboo and purple heart. Next. And uh, this bowl uh, is admired but not purchased. Most of my bowls sell for between five and eight hundred dollars, and this bowl, that bowl right there, is that big around. And and this is a bowl from a board. 
So you can see we started out with real simple stuff, but this is exactly, made exactly the same way. It's just how you choose to line the wood up. And this uh, has veneer in it as well. Next. So I did, I was real tricky with this one. I took a, a, I took a piece of the bamboo, it was three quarters of an inch thick, and a piece of the purple heart, and I resawed them on my bandsaw. So I got a quarter inch piece and a half inch piece. Now they weren't quite a quarter, quite a half, but they were close. So now I take the quarter inch piece of bamboo and the quarter inch piece of purple heart and I glue them smooth sides together. Okay? So now I got two boards that are half, not half, but partially purple heart and partially bamboo, but they're alternate. And so I then, using my software, determined how big a bowl, I already figured out how big a bowl, I do that first. How big a bowl I want to make, how much wood I have to have, and, and uh, how big my wedges have to be. And all these wedges were cut on my chop saw, okay, my miter box saw. Go ahead next. Uh, and I glued that piece of plywood on there so I can draw the circles. Next. 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 I'm cutting the thing off. Next. Now there's the middle. I've got each of these halves uh, glued together, but the two halves aren't glued together. Next. Now you can see half bam, you know, the quarter bamboo and the half purple heart. And they alternate. Okay? And that's what creates the design in the bowl. And this is this is I haven't even touched the hem of the garment in the kinds of ways that you can change the technique and the wood and all that sort of thing to create designs. Next. So <clears throat> they all have a piece of purple heart. Uh, it's not veneer, it's like an eighth of an inch stick running in between the wedges. And, and uh, next. Next. I'm cutting on a bandsaw. And now you're beginning to see the pattern take shape. Next. 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 Now we're really looking at what you pull, and I all and you offset all of those things. And what you're doing when you're offsetting is that you're actually creating a pattern flow on the bowl. Next, and that's the, the finished product. And that, um, trust me, that is a beautiful bowl. And uh, wow. I had everybody that came into the gallery where the guy was displaying it wanted to hold that bowl. It is that beautiful. That Next. Okay, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I want to tell you about, and I didn't realize this was going to happen, but uh, I have a friend who, an Aussie, Aussie guy, who needed to make an, a funeral urn. But this works for any kind of box you want to make. And uh, he said, all you got to do is go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy some PVC pieces. This is a Cut out the PVC and uh, next, and you put it in your chuck. I expanded on the inside of that particular chuck. Next, and uh, smooth the outside edge. Next, take a real thin parting tool and shape it. So, <clears throat> and and that's the, that's this piece right there. Okay, so I I, I now this was just meant for a demo piece, but I decided I knew how, what diameter that needed to be, and there's a step in there, so I created that, and then I created the lid to fit the other part next, and that's this part, and I, I don't need all that thread, I just need a little bit, so next, and I cut off what I needed, next, glued it onto the deal, and uh, and we found out, I found out after I got here that Gail's brother had died and they cremated him and she said, can you make me four little boxes? So we went to Home Depot today, or Lowe's, and bought four pieces of PVC cutouts. But here we're going to be making four little urns out of that. Next. And that's, that's what they basically look like. Okay, is that it? One more. Yep, that's it. Um. Thanks.
but the bottom isn't pretty. <laughs> and it doesn't have anything to do with the rope or the wood, but it's so easy to do something like this and think how much more attractive the that bowl would be than having that in the bottom when you look in there and say, wow, how do you do that? And trust me, this is, this is like falling off a log. Once you learn how to do it and set up a jig, <clears throat> you cut these wedges and you glue another piece of contrasting material on the wedge and then you put it on your disc sander and lightly sand it smooth so you get all of these wedges. And then, and you got a you know, contrasting color. And then, remember I'm working on two halves here. But I don't want anybody to see my joints. So I glue veneer to one side of each of these wedges to hide the joint. And then I glue this half of the wedges together and I glue this half of the wedges together and once they're glued together, then I true them up in my disc sander, and then I put one piece of veneer down the middle, put the radiator clamp on and glue it together, and you got this. This is basically the same concept. This is a little more difficult, but it, it, on my website there is a handout that you can download <coughs> and uh, shows you how to make. Of course, I'm, I'm, this is the Lone Star State, and I got to have this. <laughs> And uh, I won first prize at the Texas State Fair with a, a bowl made from, and this is actually, I made two of these. This is mesquite, ebony, and bloodwood. And uh, one of the things that I discovered, too late uh, initially, but if you're smart, you'll take a piece of wood and you'll yeah. set up your bandsaw and you'll cut this in half. Hmm. So you've got two of them oh. for the price of one, and it doesn't need to, and I, and I cover it up on the bottom with a seal, you don't even see it coming through. So, uh, that's another thing that, uh, that I've done. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation tonight, and if you're interested in a hands-on, learn how to do it all uh, in Gene's basement <laughs> on Saturday, uh, you need to, uh, we got a sheet here. Uh, do we have a sheet? No, I, got, I got my address on cards. And well, no, I don't, I don't. But we need to know tonight yeah. if you're going to come on Saturday. Yeah. If, if, if nobody's coming, I may go back to Texas. So, what's your nine o'clock? Nine o'clock. Till twelve. Uh, till twelve. You, you have to bring the beer. Though. What's your website again? You use, use the plan on? It's www.coeur. Dot. D. Oh, sorry. C O E U R dash D E dash L A R B as in boy R E dot com. Cour de Labra. Well, you can just Google my name, Ray yeah, Lamb, and, and it'll things. come up. L A R B E. L A R B R E. It's in the newsletter. If you look at the newsletter, it's up on the website. But, but just Google my name, Ray Lamb. Now, let me just take a second, if I may, uh, and I'm going to show you my website. Uh, and some of you haven't seen that. Help me here, <laughs> I turn, but I don't do electronic. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, that's it. It may take a while. Good to love everything. That's uh, me. Oops. Right. That's the night you went out in the freaking outback. <laughs> no, that's actually on the Harbor Bridge. That's standing on the Harbor Bridge. 